We are ready to get started. My name is Ali Shalander, and I'm here with um, a partner in our healthcare group, Jay Devoy, and we're going to be talking about the new Section 1557 anti discrimination rule and its effect on uh, various healthcare entities. So, with that, uh, we'll get started. At first, we got to get a couple of house um, items out of the way. Uh, this is not legal advice. Uh, we're not creating an attorney client relationship. This is merely for educational purposes. Um, and uh, we also ask that if you have any questions, shoot them in the chat. And if, uh, uh, if we have some time at the end of today, then we can answer them. If not, then we will answer them uh, individually via email. So, so first, we'll start out with a little bit of an outline. We'll be talking about the history of Section 1557 along with what it actually is. We'll talk about which entities need to comply with this. And then also the Section 1557 coordinator responsibilities are back from the 2016 rules. Uh, and we also have some revamped policies and procedures. We'll also be talking about the anti-discrimination notices and anti-discrimination in technology uh, and AI. And then we'll also talk about the ever so important uh, expanded protections for the LGBTQ community. And we'll also discuss effects on existing laws and effective dates for the various requirements. So uh, before we really dive into it, we're only going to be focusing on Section 1557, but that's not the only non-discrimination um, statute or regulation out there. We still have all these various uh, federal statutes, such as the ADA, uh, the Rehabilitation Act, uh, Title VI and Seven and Nine, and then we also can't forget about state law. In Idaho, we have the Idaho Human Rights Act. And uh, we'll kind of jump into what actually is Section 1557. So as you can see here, I won't read out everything, but basically it means that uh, nobody can discriminate somebody on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. And to get into the history a little bit, just so you can understand what we're um, playing with and um, kind of get a better picture of where everything is and, and how we got to where we are today. So the um, Affordable Care Act, uh, specifically Section 1557, became law in 2010. And it wasn't until 2016 when the Obama administration issued its first regulation. And then when the Trump administration took over, we kind of had a bit of a yo-yo uh, effect, so to speak. Uh, the Trump administration stripped a lot of the protections that were put in place by the 2016 rule. But then shortly after the 2020 rules came out, um, the Supreme Court of the United States issued its opinion in, Bost in uh, Bostock uh, the Clayton County, Georgia, and then uh, that, uh, then the Biden administration issued its own interpretation guidelines, and that basically was confirming the Supreme Court's ruling. And it, the department clarified that it will interpret and enforce Section 1557's prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sex to include discrimination on the best basis of sexual orientation and discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Now, we have revamped uh, 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 regulations and the Biden administration on May 6th published its new section 1557 rules, which is the topic of today's discussion. And also, these rules could very well change in the not so distant future, depending on who wins the presidential election later this year. So which entities must comply? Well, Section 1557 applies to all health programs or activities receiving federal financial uh, 
assistance, uh, assistance, also known as the FFA, and that can be received directly or indirectly. And basically what FFA is, is it can include any grant, loan, credit, subsidy, contract, other than a procurement contract, but including contracts of insurance or any other arrangement by which the federal government, either directly or indirectly, provides assistance or makes assistance available in some form, and that can be funds, services of federal personnel, or real or personal property, or any interest or use of such properties. And with FFA, the department provides that, uh, the pro provides or otherwise makes available um, these um, FFA that the department plays a role in providing or administering, including advanced payments, of the premium tax credit and cost sharing reduction payments under Title I of the Affordable Care Act, as well as payments, subsidies, and other funds extended by the department um, to an entity providing health insurance coverage for payment to or on behalf of a person obtaining health insurance coverage from that entity or extended by the department directly to such person for payment to any entity providing health insurance. An important thing to remember is that SFA now includes Medicare Part B funds, and that is a completely new requirement that was not in 2016-2020, um, so that's something that we need to be aware of. And then um, uh, after uh, we've got that, we also have health programs or activities administered by HHS, and then health insurance uh, for state and federally facilitated exchanges, uh, exchanges. And if you fall into one of those three categories, what we call those covered entities. So then we get into the question of what does that actually mean? Well, it means that Section 1557 applies to nearly the entire healthcare industry that receives FFA directly or indirectly. So um, the odds are that if you think you're a covered entity, you very well might be. But uh, the department has uh, come out in its preamble to the, um, to the new rules, and it basically says that it will do a fact-based analysis to determine whether uh, an entity is actually a covered entity. And the department is supposed to be providing more guidance, like a flow chart to help figure out whether or not um, an entity falls into one of those categories. But from the preamble, it gave us insight onto what entities are going to be considered covered entities. We have your, um, probably the more obvious ones as far as hospitals and health clinics, um, pharmacies. Um, we all, it will also include pharmacy benefit managers, uh, private physician practices, um, and then it'll also include health insurer, insurers receiving FFA, and that includes Medicare Parts A, C, and D payments. But they did clarify that it does not apply to employers or other plan uh, sponsors of a group health plan. And, it, and the rules also clarified that it will, that a covered entity can be a third party administrator, uh, as well as state administered programs for Medicaid and whatnot. Um, and then again, entities exchanging or receiving Medicare Part B funds. And also, uh, you'll need to do an analysis to figure out if any of your subcontractors um, for any of the above entities uh, qualifies as a covered entity. And just so you know, this is not an exhaustive list. Again, um, it's going to be a really fact-specific analysis to determine or not whether a covered, covered entity uh, uh, whether an entity is a covered entity. So as far as what do you need to do if you are a covered entity? Well, this is a pretty long list and today we're going to break it down for you. And to start off with, um, one of the first things that a covered entity needs to do is submit an assurance form to certify compliance with Section 1557. So for this assurance form, uh, when applying for FFA, an entity must promise that its health programs and activities 
will comply with Section 1557 and its implementing rules in Part 92. And they will do this by submitting um, an HHS assurance form, which will be provided by the department. And then after submitting that assurance form, when applying uh, for FFA, you can in future requests submit the assurance form uh, or you can bypass submitting the insurance, uh, the assurance form and simply incorporate the, uh, the promise in uh, 45 CFR part 92 in subsequent FFA requests. So now that we've uh, touched on what that insurance form is, now we'll get into what covered entities with 15 plus employees uh, will need to do. And the big requirement that's coming back from the 2016 rules is there needs to be a section 1557 coordinator. So, again, this requirement only applies if a covered entity has 15 or more employees. If you don't, then, uh, that, then your entity does not need to have or appoint a Section 1557 coordinator. But what it is, is it needs to be at least one employee, and they are going to be responsible for ensuring that the covered entity complies with all of the Section 1557 requirements and its implementing regulations. So some of the big uh, responsibilities that a coordinator is going to be responsible for is that they will handle the grievances that uh, complainants may file according to a grievance procedure, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. They will also ensure that the record request record keeping requirements are met. And then they'll also coordinate the effective implementation of all of the policies and procedures that we'll be discussing today, such as the language access procedures, um, effective communication procedures, and reasonable modifications procedures. And then they also need to document the um, training that the employees will receive on those policies and procedures. So now that we've talked about that, we will jump into the following policies and procedures, and I will turn the reins over to Jay. Thank you. So everyone on this call is likely very familiar with policies and procedures for any number of different healthcare entities that you're involved with, whether facilities, practices, multi-specialty groups, or anything else under the sun uh, that focuses on healthcare and we subject to these rules, especially with the expansion of their application to Medicare Part B uh, recipients. So. There's a brief overview of all the policies and procedures. None of this is necessarily new or shocking information, but it's a good reinforcement of what should be in all the policies and procedures. Namely, they need to be written. They need to include an effective date, not just for the original policies and procedure, but for any modifications that come after the fact, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, similar to other areas such as 40, um, 42 CFR Part 2, for those of you that are subject to it, to the HIPAA privacy rule and security rule obligations, the policies and procedures need to be reasonably designed to take into account the nuances of your practice and what's specific about it, the size of it, the complexity of it, the resources that are available. Do you have an IT department? Is there just one person who's responsible for IT? Is there a compliance or privacy function that is separate from a legal function, if there is a legal function within the scope of your organization? And what type of entity is it? A facility or a system of facilities, especially if it's including different types of facilities, such as a network that includes a hospital with an emergency department or just an acute hospital without any kind of emergency department, a surgery center, a uh, skilled nursing facility, in, in addition to that, a, a physician group. Those needs will be different versus a standalone facility that provides uh, surgical services, especially if it's just one specialty as opposed to multi-specialty. So taking that into account, making sure that the unique accessibility issues that are faced by that facility or that type of entity will be important in these policies to make sure they're effective. So unfortunately, there's not really one size fits all. There has to be at least some level of demonstration that the policies and procedures have been adapted to the specific type of practice that they apply to. 
And finally, most importantly, the policies and procedures need to not just be on paper, they need to be implemented and complied with all times. There is a discussion later on that I'm not going to necessarily get into now, um, but this is a preview similar to your HIPAA policy procedures and your other training materials, the training and certification that the individuals that are going to be subject to this, which will likely be everybody, if not at least the frontline staff and the caregivers, will want to be trained on this document, the training they received, such as a check-in uh, list or a certification they attended the training, and then a record of the training materials so that it, in the event of some kind of audit or some kind of citation that must be responded to, you'll be in a position where you can show what was taught, show that you taught the individuals, and remind everybody of what they were taught for any kind of corrective measures to avoid any kind of sanctions or other penalties. Uh, there are a number of specific policies and procedures that are required under Section 1557 in these new regulations. We'll be taking each one of them in turn. Uh, first is a non-discriminatory. No, first is a non-discrimination policy. Uh, the requirements are at minimum that the covered entity cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, which includes gender identity. I know that certain states have treated this in different ways, but now there's a federal standard for this, age or disability. Uh, and then in addition to national origin, that includes uh, proficiency with languages other than English. Uh, there's a requirement within the policy that the entity must provide language assistance language assistance services and auxiliary aids to patients free of charge. Uh, that is frequently a question that we've encountered in the past where people have questions about, we have a translator that came and then, for example, a patient canceled or a patient had questions about who had to pay for the translator. Subject to what's in your payer agreements, or if that's a consideration, uh, the assumption is that there needs to be a translator or at least the ability to get a translator on staff and available at the cost of the practice itself, and then down the line, who ultimately pays for it and whether it's reimbursable can be reconciled later. But most importantly, the cost of complying with this is going to be less significant than the cost of any kind of citation or any kind of investigation by a payer because of a beneficiary's complaint. Uh, the policy must also provide reasonable modifications for individuals with disabilities and also provide current contact information for the Section 1557 coordinator if one is available. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the idea of there being a privacy officer under HIPAA. For larger practices, this makes sense, and there might be designated individuals within a compliance department or a legal department or just within the administration that this would be an appropriate position for. But similar to the requirement that the policies and procedures have to be reasonable uh, for the size of the practice and what the covered entity really is in form and function, that individual might end up wearing multiple hats. It might be the sole principal owner of the practice or one of the various partners or shareholders, depending on what the covered entity is. So this is a requirement to be mindful of. It can't be ignored, but how you comply with it is something that isn't necessarily written in stone. Another policy that's required is the policy to have a grievance procedure. This applies only to covered entities with more than 15 employees, similar to other requirements for non-discrimination under federal law. Uh, if this is applicable, and it likely will be for many of our clients, the procedures at a minimum again, and this means that more can be added, there can be more detail and nuance, but at a minimum, these provisions need to be included. There has to be prompt, equitable resolution of grievances alleging any action that would be prohibited by Section 1557 or its enabling regulations. There must be a retention of records regarding that grievance, including the grievance itself, any response, corrective action, and any kind of records that occurred within that, such as communication among the staff, for no less than three years from the date of the resolution of the grievance. And there's more detail about what's, what must be included in these records, and specifically includes the grievance, the date that the grievance was filed, the name and contact information of the complainant, the alleged discriminatory conduct and the basis of discrimination, for example, race, age, sexual identity, or gender expression, the date of the resolution and what the resolution was, and any other pertinent information. Now, more detail can be helpful in creating this file. As noted, this is just the minimum that needs to be required, but there's other considerations as well. Uh, for example, if you consult with your legal counsel, if you consult with in-house counsel on resolving this specifically, it's important to make sure that those materials that are attorney-client privileged maybe aren't made part of the file as they're not required, or if there is the pursuit of legal counsel, make sure that those materials are marked as attorney-client privileged so that those can be withheld and subject to a privilege log if there's ever any kind of litigation or some kind of administrative proceeding where this is something that would have to come to light and there would be 
the, there would be measures in place to avoid the inadvertent disclosure of attorney-client privilege communication. Uh, finally, the identity of the complainant needs to remain confidential except as required by law or necessary to comply with Part 92, such as conducting an investigation. Uh, this is similar to any other kind of employee investigation or other employee grievance um, or patient grievance, where generally the individual's identity should be known to the smallest number of individuals who have a need to know that information for a valid purpose. So it shouldn't be broadcast anywhere. It shouldn't be the topic of water cooler discussion. It needs to be in the file, but in the course of investigating this, when there's for example, if you're trying to schedule an interview with an employee or having general correspondence about this, identify the person as the patient or the complainant uh, so that that information stays as closely guarded as possible the same way that it would for employee information and especially employee information that might be subject to confidentiality under the Americans with Disabilities Act, such as medical information in connection with FMLA leave or um, some other medical accommodation. All covered entities need to comply with the language access procedures. Again, the minimums that need to be reflected in the policies and procedures that can be modified based on the needs of your specific covered entity and reflect the realities of how the medicine is practiced in your area. Uh, there must be a description of the process for providing language assistance services to individuals with limited English proficiency, current contact information for the Section 1557 coordinator, uh, a description of how an employee would identify whether an individual has limited English proficiency. Uh, unfortunately, individuals who have limited English proficiency may not be the first ones to admit that or be forthcoming about it. So having employees, especially employees that might come from the same cultural background or be bilingual would be helpful in establishing whether there would be that limited proficiencies and understand what that would necessarily look like and also may be able to communicate with that patient better than somebody asking somebody in English, do you understand what I'm saying? And the patient, either due to lack of comprehension or embarrassment, not giving a forthright answer and then not understanding their treatment or what they're being told by their care provider. And it's a situation that nobody wants to be in. Uh, the policy and procedure needs to also address how an ident employee obtains the services of qualified interpreters and translators uh, that the covered entity would use to communicate with the individual with limited English proficiency. Um, depending on the metro where you operate and what's available, it can be something where if there's a translation service that's available, having a relationship with them so you can get somebody on call or being able to anticipate the needs better so to understand if there's a way to flag in patient files and scheduling to understand a day in advance or two days in advance when you might need that coverage if it's not something your organization can provide in-house. And we'll discuss the particularities and the qualifications for doing that later on. It can be useful to flag that and understand in advance, oh, we need to have somebody who's proficient in this language. It might be a very common one like Spanish, or it might be one that, while common, uh, is not as readily available such as Tagalog. And for that reason, making sure you have those relationships on the front end and having the Section 1557 coordinator or some other personnel responsible for doing the coordination activity on the front end would be extremely beneficial. An additional, in addition, the policies and procedures need to identify any qualified bilingual staff members. This is an area where the policy procedure might need to be updated. You might want to have a cut date to say, as of the date of this last policy procedure update, the qualified bilingual staff members are, and then list the following or list them in an appendix. And note that the appendix might be updated more frequently, uh, just because this is an area where there might be a trap to say, these are the individuals depending on how large the organization is or how small it is and what the turnover is like, this can create a trap where there might need to be frequent updates. So just saying it will be updated on a annual or biannual basis uh, or semi-annual basis to state that there will be an update to reflect the current individuals, that would be helpful to avoid the idea that the policy or procedure could be construed to be requiring constant updates or to create a policy procedure that create that requires those kind of constant updates so that a lot of time is spent on this uh, documentation piece of it rather than actual compliance. And then finally, a list of any electronic or written translated materials that the covered entity has, the language that they're translated into, the, their date of issuance, and how to access the electronic translation, translations. This is something that would likely be identified as kind of an, an, an index of sorts. So it would require an inventory of all of the electronic materials, the languages that exist at, when they were last updated, uh, similar to the policy procedure, maintaining the original issue date and the last updated date and uh, the information about where they reside. So I, this is something that likely can be complied with in the form of having a very large table and making a separate appendix or index to the policies and procedures.
Uh, finally, all the all of the all of the protect all the covered entities need to have these effective communication procedures, and require a description of the process for ensuring com effective communication for individuals with disabilities. Current contact information for the Section 1557 coordinator: How an employee would obtain the service of qualified interpreters that the covered entity uses. Going back to my point earlier about having those relationships in advance and having an information sheet similar to how hospitals have their list of uh, entities that they would use for discharge planning, such as if somebody's discharged to home and they would need home services, whether home care or um, either home care or uh, skilled services within the home, or if the individual will be discharged to a skilled nursing facility, a list of the options that exist there. Uh, some similar resource would be useful to employees to make sure that they could quickly get these resources in place. Uh, similar to the prior requirement, there's the list of bilingual staff members that's required. Setting a basis or a time frame for updating that would be helpful in avoiding kind of compliance traps. And information about how to access appropriate auxiliary aids and services. It could be anything from telling individuals what translation services are recommended, or if there's other resources that might be available for specific patients, such as relying on family members that they would trust, again, subject to the more specific information about doing that that's contained later in this presentation. Again, the policies and procedures are more or less living documents. They get updated periodically, especially through trial and error. So there's a procedure for modifying what the policies and procedures are, again, to reflect the uniqueness of your covered entity and the circumstances that you encounter. So the policies and procedures ideally would have a separate policy that would include, at minimum, a description of the process for making reasonable modifications to the policies, practices, or procedures when necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of a disability. Uh, such as saying here's a special case or here are edge cases that might appear and here's what the protocol would be. It's a list that necessarily might be a little bit backward looking after over time in advance, especially if you have a lot of data, you know, your practice or entity has been around for a long time. It knows the kind of uh, issues that you encounter. You can anticipate a certain number of these, but there will always be some certain number of backward looking circumstances that you addressed. And now you know how to fix them in the future, but this will likely be updated more than any other policy and procedure. Now, there will be description for the process for responding to requests for um, changes from individuals who have disabilities or any kind of exceptions or adjustments, what the criteria are and what would be necessary there. Uh, this is kind of analogous to the questions that you might have been facing about emotional support animals versus the service animals that uh, are required to be present under the ADA because they have necessary training rather than a doctor's note for be providing emotional support. And the kind of questions that have occurred there and any adaptation to your policy and procedures that have been made to reflect that. Um, sometimes, uh, some practices choose to be more accommodating of it, whereas for others, it's a complete non-starter, such as an allergist group. And then finally, this modification procedure needs to describe the process for determining whether the modification would fundamentally alter the nature of the health program of activity, including identifying alternative modifications that would not result in the fundamental alteration to ensure the individual with a disability receives the benefit of the services in question. So the idea there would be, how far can this be modified before it defeats the purpose this is a similar concept to a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. If the reasonable accommodation is not reasonable and it defeats the ability to perform a specific service and the, or perform an essential job task as the ADA would be applied to an employee, the same concept applies here. If there's an accommodation that can't be provided, such as asking for certain levels of dermatology through telemedicine, uh, that is something that is not required to be provided, but some forward thinking and anticipation of what patients have asked for in the past and might ask for in the future and what would work and what would not work. And furthermore, a reason why it would work would be helpful to avoid compliance traps and be useful in the event of any kind of audit. So we're moving on now to what the relevant employees need to be trained for their policies and procedures. This is uh, an item for Allie, and she'll be talking about this now. Yeah, and with these uh, training procedures, we'll, we'll kind of just dive into it. So uh, the covered entity is required to train all employees on the policies and procedures that it's implemented that uh, Jay just discussed. And then... Uh, importantly, like we mentioned before, there needs to be documentation that the employee 
completed the training and then retain that documentation for at least three years. Now, the keyword is relevant employees, and it's, it's very broad, and it includes current and future permanent and temporary employees and contractors. So that could be travel nurses, um, it could be um, IT contractors, uh, and you've really got to figure out whether or not um, uh, the real test for determining whether that person is a relevant employee is whether they interact with patients and members of the public. If uh, they aren't doing that, then there's, there's not really um, a risk that they would run afoul of, or at least um, the department doesn't see that there's a risk that they'd run afoul of um, Section 1557. And then with that, um, does that person make any decisions that directly or indirectly affect a patient's health care? And um, that can um, include your executive leadership team and in-house counsel. So uh, with that, then if a person performs any tasks or makes any decisions that affect a patient's financial obligations, they would then be a relevant employee. And that can include um, your billing and collection specialist. And HHS put in their preamble to the rules that when in doubt, um, that covered uh, if you're trying to figure out whether or not a relevant employee or whether an employee is a relevant employee the covered entity has discretion to train all its employees and it even encouraged uh, the covered entities to train all employees on these policies and procedures in case they do happen to come into contact with patients and members of the public or they make certain decisions that affect the patient's care um, or they can, especially as uh, employees that have been in an organization a while, move their way up the, um, the ladder, so to speak. And then we need to, we need to talk about timing and, and frequency. So for the training, all relevant, all current relevant employees need to be trained no later than 30 days following the implementation of the policies, procedures, and um, no later than, uh, it says May 1st, um, but um, it's supposed to say uh, July 5th, 2025. And we'll fix that before we send the materials out to you. And then for new relevant employees, again, that can include travel nurses that are on a contract basis or other contract workers, um, or whenever there's a, uh, whenever there are revisions to the policies and procedures, training must occur within a reasonable period of time after the relevant employee joins or after the policies or procedures are revised. And of course, the department couldn't make it easy on us and tell us what a reasonable period of time is, but um, based on the timing, we can, in, uh, timing requirements such as 30 days following implementation of policies and procedures, I would probably err on the side of having those new employees or uh, whenever there's a re revision, I would have another training uh, within 30 days of the new employee joining uh, or whenever there is a uh, revision to the policies. And then as far as frequency, uh, in its preamble and um, explanation of some of the uh, regulations related to the timing, Timing, the department recommends that training occur frequently. Again, didn't really define it, but it did explain that, uh, that it found that entities that were dealing with HIPAA employee-related violations, those violations were not occurring as often where the required HIPAA training um, is provided uh, on a routine basis compared to other entities where they didn't necessarily do that. And also, as far as content, just to uh, get at that a little bit, HHS threw in recommendations as far as making them interactive, having people engage in different types of scenarios to have them be more engaged in the training session so that you don't have kind of the glaze effect when they are going over slides um, on a presentation. Um, and also, as far as frequently, um, it can be inferred that if there haven't been any new revisions 
uh, then they say that you can have that training occur at least once a year, like during an annual policy and procedures um, uh, training that your employees will need to go through, whether to get um, training on HIPAA or other regulatory requirements. So now that we've talked about the, um, the training procedures, now Jay will talk about the notices of non-discrimination and the separate notice of availability and language uh, assistance services and auxiliary aids and services. you're on mute, I think. I was. Uh, thank you. So the two new requirements that were created and codified under the latest rulemaking, the first of which goes back to the original uh, notifications that were required under the Section 1557 regulations during the Obama administration. And the first of these two requirements, the first of these two notices that have to be provided on at least an annual basis and as, upon the request of a patient and would have to be posted in a public place such as a patient lobby or another uh, prominent area along with any other kind of required notices by state law and your other notices required under HIPAA and federal law. The first is a notice of non-discrimination. If you have any kind of digital platform for providing documentation in the kind of tickler system to make sure that any updated forms or required forms that go on an annual basis are provided to patients, this is a bit easier to manage. If it's something that would require an annual passing of actual paper copies to a patient, uh, setting January 1st or the end of the month of January as your annual checkpoint for that can make sure that that's a useful opportunity to set any appointments after that date is the first appointment for that year or that year after that start point to make sure that the patients receive the latest version of this document. The notice of non-discrimination requires a number of um, con a number of different items to be contained within it. It has to be presented in a specific way. Uh, all the way down to the font of it, uh, specifically, it has to be in no smaller than 20-point sans serif font, meaning something like Arial and uh, in a location where it's reasonable to expect individuals seeking service from the health program to read or hear the notice. It also has to be provided in a conspicuous location on the website along with other notices that are required, such as uh, the HIPAA required notices that must be on a website as well. The specific items that must be concluded in this notice are generally described as uh, the requirement that the covered entity does not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. The covered entity provides reasonable modifications for individuals who do have disabilities and appropriate auxiliary aids and services that include qualified interpreters for individuals with disabilities, um, such as limited English proficiency, and information in alternate formats free of charge to the patient and in a timely manner. The notice of non-discrimination also has to acknowledge that there's language assistance services to individuals who have limited English proficiency and that these would include electronic and written translated documents as well as an oral interpretation for the patient free of charge to the patient. There must be a general description about how to obtain the reasonable modifications to the policies and procedures along with obtaining the auxiliary aids and services and language assistance services that are requ uh, required to be offered by the covered entity. The contact information for the covered entity section 1557 coordinator if applicable. The availability of the grievance procedure including how to file a grievance how to file a discrimination complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services and its Office for Civil Rights, often just by including contact information for doing so, similar to the HIPAA notice of policies, uh, privacy policies, and other information needs to be provided to patients under those regulations. In addition to that, information about how to access the covered entity's website that would provide the contents of this notice, such as a URL, what would be available. Now, in addition to the notice of non-discrimination, the notice of availability of language assistance services is similar uh, 
in some ways to the requirements that were originally promulgated under regulations for Section 1557 in the Obama administration, specifically with the types and number of languages that they would have to be translated into. Specifically, the notice of availability of language assistance services and auxiliary aids has to be provided for participants, beneficiaries, enrollees, and applicants of any health program that is served by the covered entity. It must be provided in English and the 15 languages most commonly spoken by individuals with limited English proficiency within the states and other localities where the covered entity operates. Fortunately, this information is maintained by CMS and HHS, and this information can be received from their website, along with some model language that can be used for the purpose of these translations. So there is some guidance available to the government. I wouldn't rely on it for all of the translations, but for complying with some of this information, there is some help available from the government for common translations and information about which languages need to be provided in your locality. Alternative formats need to be provided as well. There are certain resources available from CMS. Like the notice of non-discrimination, this has to be provided on an annual basis and upon the request of any patient and posted in a conspicuous location within the covered entities locations and on the website. There's similar requirements with respect to how it needs to be posted. This may require more than just an eight and a half by 11 printing, uh, just based on the information that has to be provided and the requirement that the font be no smaller than 20 points. So. It may be a larger notice and require accommodation or working with a, a signing company if it's needed in multiple locations and uh, the information is roughly the same. Now, within, the, within electronic and written communications, information about this notice of availability of language assistance services uh, needs to include the foregoing, namely notice of non-discrimination, the notice of privacy practices required by HIPAA, notices of denial of termination of eligibility, benefits or services, including explanations of benefits, and notices of appeal and grievance rights, uh, other forms such as application of application and intake forms, discharge papers, complaint forms, and patient member handbooks. And finally, communications that are related to an individual's rights, eligibility, benefits, or services that require response, uh, any communication regarding a public health emergency, information about the costs and payment of care, such as information that might be have to be required in the no surprise billing regulations, and other information regarding medical billing and collections materials. All of this is going to be subject to the requirements of possibly being translated and have to be explained to patients to their satisfaction if they have a limited English proficiency. Finally, if the covered entity can comply with this notice requirement, or rather, a covered entity can comply with this notice requirement if it provides the individual with the option to opt out of the notice on an annual basis. However, the option is not something that it's a one and done where the patient opts out and they can never uh, receive the materials again or can't opt in again. Uh, they can only opt out if the option and the communications are made in their primary language and without either the primary language or through appropriate auxiliary aids and services if necessary. Uh, the practice or the covered entity cannot condition any receipt of aid or benefit on the decision to opt out of complying with this auxiliary language notice and uh, uh, use of these services. The covered entity has to inform the individual the right to request the notice in their primary language and through appropriate aids and services, as well as the right to receive any language assistance services that they need to understand the materials that are being provided. The person's opt-out must be documented on an annual basis and comply with these requirements in addition to any new requirements that might be promulgated in the future. And a silence does not count as an, opt, as an opt out. The opt out has to be affirmative and require the patient to take some action to specifically opt out. The opt out cannot itself be a matter where failure to respond to constitutes an opt out of this kind of communication. The opt outs further has to document the individual's primary language and, and their use of any appropriate auxiliary aids and services. In addition to that, the opt-out and the further communication has to provide all the materials and communications in the patient's primary language and through any appropriate auxiliary aids and services that the patient requires, or the notice has to be provided in the individual's primary language and through any auxiliary appropriate, I'm sorry, appropriate auxiliary aids and services and in all written and electronic communications identified in the prior slide, namely communications about billing, communications about eligibility determinations, and any other services that are received, and uh, communications that are required pursuant to other regulations, specifically HIPAA.
Uh, next, we'll be talking about the non-discrimination requirements and how those are satisfied uh, through specific actions that each covered entity must take. All right, so uh, now just at a general broad picture, we have very uh, similar language to what we saw in the statute at the beginning, and um, it basically the general um, anti-discrimination prohibition is that, um, except as provided in Title I of the ACA, um, a covered entity cannot uh, discriminate uh, against an individual on the basis of the race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, or any combination thereof. And with this, um, with HHS's new interpretation, they also ex um, interpret sex, um, uh, they also interpret sex to mean the, uh, sorry, to include sexual characteristics, um, including intersex traits, pregnancy-related conditions, your sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex stereotypes. And um, this is a very uh, broad interpretation of the meaning of sex, and it definitely seems to encompass or is trying to encompass all um, facets of the LGBTQ community, um, as well as recognizing um, pregnant um, Women and pregnancy, um, or their or pregnancy-related conditions. So, with that general understanding, we'll kind of dig into the meat a little bit, and we'll go over um, how to provide meaningful access for individuals with limited English profic proficiency. And a covered entity must take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to each individual and their companions with limited English profic proficiency eligible to receive or likely to be directly affected by the covered entities programs. So we've heard a lot of these terms throughout the presentation, but we need to go into what these terms actually mean. And first we'll start off with companion. That can be a family member, a friend, um, another um, an associate of the individual, that's um, seeking the access to the services and they tag along with that individual and this person um, uh, also uh, as we stated earlier um, they also are entitled to um, the language access um, requirements that we discussed earlier on and then individuals with limited English proficiency. We, um, we've tossed that around a lot today, but basically that's an individual whose primary language for communication is not English and who has a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. So they can maybe do like a little bit of um, a conversation and carry it on for a little bit, but it kind of ends there. If they're not able to articulate their pain or their problem clearly, then that would probably mean that that person would need interpretive services. And, um, uh, and again, like they may be competent in English, but um, they would still be considered a, a limited English proficient for other purposes. And then of course, uh, the department it is uh, declined to define reasonable sets or meaningful access, even though a lot of commentators were requesting that they define those. Um, and, uh, but to fulfill this requirement in general, we have language assistance services that must be provided free of charge, uh, accurately and timely, and protect, protect the privacy and the independent decision-making ability of the individual. So well, there's a lot to unpack with this inquiry, but it, it and it differs from the 2016 and 20 um, and 2020 rules. For instance, um, the language assistance services can include in-person or a more or remote oral language assistance by a qualified interpreter, paper or electronic written translation performed by a qualified interpreter, and written notice of availability of language assistance services. And there are specific requirements 
uh, that uh, related to interpreter and uh, translation services that an entity must comply with. And that means that the uh, covered entity needs to uh, offer those qualified individuals um, that they do have access to um, an interpreter in their language. And also they need to use a qualified translator uh, when required. And then in regards to AI, um, this is a very new requirement that HHS is uh, roping into it. And uh, when there's a use of AI, there needs to still be a qualified human translator to review the AI um, translation when the text is critical to the benefits or meaningful access of an individual with limited English prof uh, proficiency. And then also accuracy is essential as we've learned and we've seen all the horror stories online. Um, AI is, um, likes to lie and make up um, uh, information when they don't know the answer to something or when it doesn't know the answer to something. And, um, and then also a covered entity um, would also need to have the source documents and materials be interpreted by a human translator when it's complex um, and it's non-literal or very technical language such as um, when uh, scribing um, uh, or tr uh, Describing a um, medical record uh, interaction. And now, now I'll turn it over to Jay for uh, to discuss qualified interpreters. Yeah, to comply with these regulations, there's very specific requirements and definitions that are utilized. Uh, being mindful of time, we'll briefly discuss it in the materials more specifically cited in the regulations that are identified in the slides. But a qualified interpreter needs to be somebody who has appropriate qualifications and applies, adheres to specific ethical principles. And as a matter of defensive medicine, as much as people don't like to hear that term, if there's ever a miscommunication issue that leads to a claim, whether to a licensing board or a malpractice claim, it's important to make sure that the person person that was used to communicate has appropriate certifications that are issued to show that they're qualified, that they've had training, and that the, your entity used the correct person to serve in this translation purpose, not just to comply with the regulation, but that had command and sufficient training in not just the language, but in translation to make sure that this was accurately translated. And it becomes very significant with certain languages that have multiple different dialects and are spe spoken differently across different nationalities or nations and across different regions of the same country. So there's, these standards are identified in this slide in terms of who qualifies as a qualified interpreter. And there are other ways to seek interpretation as well. In this slide, we discussed the idea that there's going to be relay interpretation, and which means interpreting from one language to another using intermediate language, such as, for example, if there's not somebody that is, can translate from Portuguese to English, since Portuguese is spoken in a large swath of South America, it might be possible to use two translators, one to communicate from with the patient to translate from Portuguese to Spanish, which are related but dissimilar, and then again from Spanish to English to make that final relay to a, from a Portuguese-speaking patient to an English-speaking physician or other caregiver. And in those circumstances, there are provisions that allow that to be done. Now, there are certain things that the covered entity cannot do. The covered entity cannot require an individual to provide their own interpreter or to pay the cost of the interpreter. The covered entity cannot all, also cannot rely on a minor child to interpret or facilitate communication. This is something that happens in a number of first-generation families where children that are raised in an English-speaking school or predominantly English-speaking environment are relied upon to translate for parents. This is something that while a fact of life and it's something that adult children may wish to do for their parents is something that is specifically prohibited by this regulation, except if it's done as a temporary measure while finding a qualified interpreter or in the case of an emergency, if there's those exigent circumstances where some level of translation is necessary as opposed to waiting for the qualified translator, which should always be obtained and should always be sought in those circumstances. Finally, a covered entity cannot rely on staff other than qualified interpreters, translators, or qualified multilingual staff to communicate with individuals that have uh, limited English proficiency. 
the people have to opt in, and this goes back to the prior regulation about making sure that there's an identification of who are the multilingual or bilingual staff that are within your practice or covered entity. Additionally, the, there are definitions as to who constitutes the qualified translators or qualified uh, interpreters for this purpose. Uh, within the regulation, there's a definition of the qualified translator, meaning a translator who has demonstrated proficiency in writing and understanding both written English and at least one other non-English language is able to translate effectively, accurately, and partially, and adheres to generally accepted interpreter ethics principles, including client confidentiality. In these kind of circumstances as well, whether with a one-off interpreter or translator or with a service that's going to be used, it will likely be important to think about HIPAA as well and have a business associate agreement in place to ensure the confidentiality of that information as it'll be used going forward. So the qualified multilingual or bilingual staff is defined in the regulation as follows, meaning that it's a person in the covered entity's workforce who's designated by both the covered and by the covered entity to provide the in-language oral assistance as part of the person's current assigned job responsibilities. And they've just demonstrated that they've been proficient in speaking and understanding both language and at least one other language, including any necessary specialized vocabulary, terminology, and phraseology, especially relevant for medical care, and that that individual is able to effectively, accurately, and impartially communicate directly with individuals with limited English proficiency. Now, the reason why this is the there is the important distinction that this is part of the individual's current and assigned job responsibilities is to make sure that this is within the normal scope of the work for a nurse or a medical assistant or another caregiver as opposed to taking somebody who has no background in the clinical context, such as somebody who works in the billing department, somebody who works in compliance, somebody who works in um, you know, accounting and putting them in that circumstance because they happen to be bilingual. So there's a need to make sure that the language that's being used and the appropriateness of it lines up with somebody who's working in the care context and that kind of communication is part of the usual assigned job responsibilities rather than just grabbing somebody because they happen to be bilingual and even if they have a function that's unrelated to care. There are other prohibitions here such as relying on an adult that's not qualified as an interpreter as a uh, to provide those interpretation or translation services with narrow exceptions, namely, is a temporary measure while finding a qualified interpreter, even if that person is an adult, such as an adult child of somebody that has limited English proficiency. Uh, and there's another exception here where the individual with limited English proficiency specifically requests in private with a qualified interpreter present without accompanying adult that the accompanying adult interpret or facilitate communication. Again, this might be a romantic partner or an adult child or a close friend uh, that serves in that capacity, but although it has not been uncommon for people to be in that position in the past. Now there's some regulatory codification of what's required in the circumstances when that can be done without jeopardizing the practice in any way. Finally, there's a, the option for video remote interpreting services, and that would be done in a way that uh, allows for real-time full motion video and audio, similar to how many states allow for the use of telemedicine, and that would allow the translation to be effective and make sure that people can rip, lip read in addition to hear the language and make sure they understand through context and inflection uh, a, a correct understanding and translation of the language. Uh, the image has to be clear and is to be large enough to display the interpreter and the participating person's face. Uh, there has to be a clear and audible transmission of voices and adequate training to users of the technology and other persons involved so that they may quickly and efficiently set this up rather than taking an hour to figure out what was what would be needed to do so. Ideally, this would be something that could be implemented through a tablet, a laptop, or if there are computers in the room, making sure that there are software licenses so that in each office there would be a computer that can use the service rather than the equivalent of having to bring out the AV card uh, from elementary school. Now, turning to how a covered entity would comply with 1557 as to effective communication, information, and communication technology, uh, we were cognizant of time, so we're just going to try to wrap this up relatively shortly here, but I'll turn it over to Allie, and then we have just a few more topics we want to make sure we cover, summarize what's in the slides, and then rely back to them and answer any questions that you submit through chat, and we can follow up via email. Yeah, so now we'll talk about the effective communication and information and um, technology for individuals with disabilities. And just real quick, um, a disability is a physical 
or a mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities. And a major life activity can include um, uh, caring, uh, not being able to, uh, caring for oneself or um, performing manual tasks, uh, seeing or hearing, standing, um, reading, concentrating, thinking, and the like. And uh, a major life activity also includes the operation of a major bodily function, um, including functions of the uh, immune system. Uh, so that would be like a rheumatoid arthritis situation, normal cell growth, digestive, bowel, um, bladder, and um, the rest of the um, major organs um, system. And then as, as far as what a covered entity must do, they must take the appropriate steps to ensure that those individuals have access to uh, uh, communication and um, interpretation services. Uh, they also must make sure that, they're, uh, that the individual with a disability um, can get auxiliary aids and services, and these need to be provided free of charge in accessible formats and in a timely manner in a way that protects the privacy and independence of the individual with a disability. And then as far as what are auxiliary aids and services, uh, just briefly, um, we've got methods of making um, orally delivered information available to persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. And then we've also got methods for making vis uh, visually delivered materials available to persons who are blind or have low vision. Uh, third, we have um, modifying equipment and devices. This includes modification of medical equipment such as Im imaging machines, making sure that um, individuals with disabilities are able to uh, get those images taken without having to um, really extend themselves to either get in a um, a CT scan machine or an MRI or whatnot. And then um, then HHS also uh, really likes to do this. They have a kind of catch-all category um, where um, as for auxiliary aids and services, it could just be other similar services and actions. And um, then I'll let Jay um, uh, follow up on that. So similar to what we were discussing earlier, the idea of there being necessary uh, necessity for individuals that would require the need of a translator or interpreter. There are circumstances where an individual not only is an interpreter, but they have a disability as well. So it adds another layer to the requirements for the individuals who can serve in that capacity. So there is a definition in the regulations for a qualified interpreter for an individual with a disability, which means an interpreter who through a video remote interpreting service or on-site has a demonstrated proficiency in communicating in both an English language and a non-English language, which includes American Sign Language or other sign languages, or some other communication modalities, such as cued language translators or oral transliteration, such as lip reading. That individual has to prove that they can translate and interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially, and that they would adhere to effective, uh, generally ex accepted ethical principles and client confidentiality. There's similarly restrictions on what a covered entity can do in these circumstances, namely to require an individual with a disability to bring another individual to interpret for him or her. Um, with or without a disability, there is no requirement that patients have or bear the cost of their own interpretation. And similarly, the, there is not a requirement, there, the covered entity cannot rely on an adult that happens to accompany the individual that has a disability, which might be there for other purposes such as mobility, uh, and require that person to effectively translate for the individual who has a disability. And there are narrow exceptions for an emergency circumstance where the interpreter is not available or where the individual with the disability specifically requests that the accompanying adult, the accompanying adult uh, interpret or facilitate communication. Note that this does not apply to minor children, and there is this specific restriction in the last bullet says that the covered entity cannot rely on a minor child to interpret or facilitate communication except for an emergency involving an imminent threat where there is no interpreter available. The telecommunications are another consideration uh, for effectively communicating with individuals who have disability. If a covered entity communicates with the patient by telephone, uh, text to, text to uh, telephone such as TTY or other communication systems have to be used to communicate with those individuals. If a covered entity uses an automated attendant system like voicemail or messaging for interactive voice response system or one of those touch uh, pad systems for we use a dial tone and navigate the menu, the system has to provide an effective real-time 
communication with individuals using auxiliary aids and services, including TTY phones. So in those circumstances, individuals that have a disability can just type zero the same way that other people can to effectively short circuit that system and speak with a live individual on the same way that many of us like we do when we're working through an automated system and know that we need to contact an individual, but don't necessarily know the name department, but can describe the situation better than we can navigate a specific menu that's been presented. Uh, finally, a covered entity has to respond to telephone rooms calls from telecommunication relay services established under the ADA in the same manner that responds to other telephone calls. So that means in essence, if there's the equivalent of a collect call that's received, the covered entity can't turn it away. It has to be answered, even if there are additional fees and costs that are incurred with that, or if it requires expanding the services that the covered entity receives from its telephony services. Additionally, there's a requirement for signage and other information. Uh, the covered entity has to provide information that interested persons can obtain information about the existence and location of accessible services, activities, and facilities. Um, signage has to be posted in accessible interest entrances, directing users to an accessible entrance or a location where they can obtain information about accessible facilities. Uh, this might be if there's a building that is occupied where a suite has multiple entrances or if it's multiple suites or a whole building put together, for example, a fire exit, an auxiliary exit, a utility closet that the fire department could use to shut off utilities or gain access to water, all of those entrances would need to direct the person, such as through an arrow or a description, to use the different entrance or use the main entrance, which ideally would have a level entry point or would have some kind of ramp or other accessible egress to allow individuals who might have limited mobility or other challenges to easily access the facility. Initially, the international symbol for accessibility must be used at each accessible entrance. So in addition to the other signage you would have, uh, the sign that's indicated here on the slide would be displayed there as well. There's also a dimension to this for accessing information on the internet. This is becoming increasingly popular and there are, is a trend of ADA claims and lawsuits against websites for not being su sufficiently accessible. Related to that, there's a requirement for any, any recipient of federally, uh, federal funds assistance and any state exchange for health, and, health insurance will have to ensure that it's programs and activities that are on the website or a mobile application would have to comply with the requirements of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which is interpreted through the ADA and similarly have functions like text to type, have the ability to have an individual be accessible to reach uh, and communicate regarding the contents of that website and the information within it. Finally, we're going to talk about ensuring that buildings and facilities are accessible to all. This is something that is consistent with the ADA, but is also implicated by Section 1557 because of its application to individuals that have disabilities or other limitations. So there's this requirement requires that any facility or part of a facility where health programs or activities are conducted uh, must comply with the section, uh, the applicable sections of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the standards of design that were adopted in 2010. Now, if the facility is grandfathered, such as, for, for example, it was commenced before July 18th, 2016, and it was under construction prior to that point or designed prior to that point, um, if, the com if the construction was commenced after January 18th, 2018, then uh, it would still have to comply with those standards. So this is kind of a physical plant piece where there might need to be, especially for new facilities or relatively recent facilities that were completed either before or during the pandemic, uh, there might be a need to go back and make some modifications if necessary or to go back to refer to the plans and the designs to make sure they are compliant. As long as the construction was done in compliance with the 1991 ADA standards for accessible but not designed and the 2010 standards, then the facility will be deemed to be in compliance. Uh, this is really relevant too for health systems and payers that are um, in that operate in connection. I'm sorry, health systems and practices that operate in conjunction with payers. Since a lot of this construction and other activity came as a result of the requirement of the under the Affordable Care Act to spend a certain substantial ratio on uh, activities and claims, uh, the activities related to care, which would also include building out facilities such as skilled nursing facilities and surgical centers. And there was the boom of that that happened around the time and following the 2010 standards just due to the timing and implementation of the ACA and these standards. 
This new construction likely was built with that in mind, but for anything that's been particularly recent, it's important to take another look at this and make sure that there's no potential invitation for claims. Finally, if there's a facility where health programs or activities are conducted that is paid for uh, by these federal funds or used for any kind of health insurance activities, it would be deemed to comply with the applicable rules if the construction or alteration, such as a remodel or other substantial change to the property, was done in conformity with the uniform federal accessibility standards, uh, was commenced before July 18th, 2016, or the facility was not complied not required to comply with a different accessibility standard, uh, such as for, because it was grandfathered and hasn't been updated in a very long time. There's a whole separate discussion to be had about the ADA. However, it's important being mindful of any work that you might have questions about or if there have been other complaints about the facility or if it was completed at some point in the last 15 years or so, but there's a question about the date, it's important to look at that and make sure that the last time that the facility was either constructed or remodeled or updated in some meaningful way, ideally in a way that would require uh, the pulling of permits from local authorities to do that, uh, that would generally be a right line in terms of confirming that the changes that were made to the facility or any updates that were performed would comply with applicable law. And then we'll turn this over to Ali. She will be talking about providing equal access on the basis of sex. Ali, you might be muted. Oh, sorry. There you go. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Thank you. And I want to note that for this final rule, it expands protection for the LGBTQ individuals and pregnant individuals, but does not compel covered entities to perform gender affirming procedures or abortion. But what it, uh, but what a covered entity must do uh, is that it can't, um, uh, sorry, what they cannot do is that they cannot deny or limit their services um, or uh, deny or limit a uh, healthcare provider's ability to provide services um, if such denial or limitation uh, effectively excludes individuals from participation in those programs or would otherwise object to discrimination based on sex. And that includes um, based on an individual's sex assigned at birth, gender identity, or gender otherwise recorded. And also a covered entity cannot adopt a policy um, or practice of treating individuals differently or separating them based on sex in a manner that subjects them to more than a de minimis harm, uh, including adopting a policy or preventing an individual from participating in its program. And a covered entity can also, or cannot um, uh, deny or limit the gender transition or gender affirming care services that a covered entity offers if the denial or limitation is based on an individual's sex assigned at birth, gender identity, um, or gender otherwise um, recorded. And um, just to reiterate, if a covered entity does not provide those services, it is this does not obligate them to provide those services if it um, already does not. Um, if they have it, it's just that the implementation of providing uh, those services or access for those services, it just cannot be done on a um, discriminatory basis. Um, but uh, with that, if a covered entity has a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for denying or limiting a service, uh, including if the covered entity declines or determines that the health services is not clinically appropriate for the individual, then again, uh, this new rule does not force that covered entity to provide those health services. And then as related to health insurance coverage, uh, a covered entity cannot deny or limit coverage or coverage of a claim or impose additional cost sharing or other limitations or restrictions on the covered to an individual based on their sex assigned at birth, gender identity, or gender otherwise included. And then for specific health services related to a gender transition or other gender affirming care, um, if such denial limitation or restriction results in discrimination on the basis of sex. And um, also a covered entity cannot have or implement a categorical coverage exhaustion or limitation for all health services related to gender transition or other uh, 
gender affirming care. And uh, finally, when determining whether an individual satisfies um, a criteria um, regarding access to its uh, health program, a covered entity just cannot take into account an individual sex. Um, and uh, it, as far as like in applying any rule concerning that individual's current perceived potential or past marital, parental, or family status. And I'll let, I'll turn it over to Jay to discuss the last um, topic. Great. So patient decision tools, uh, we talked a little bit about technology earlier. Ali made mention of AI. Uh, just same, same rhythm that we've been encountering for this entire presentation, which is basically there is no allowance for discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, or disability. There is an ongoing obligation to make efforts to identify uses of patient care, decision support school tools. This applies most immediately to telemedicine, but there's increasingly some idea of use for AI and predictive AI that's bolstered by the use of data over the last decade, specifically uh, in connection with practices and tools that practices have obtained largely from the large data sets that they, they've been able to obtain or that uh, other companies such as payers have been able to obtain that have predictive value, such as seeing when BMI turns over to a certain point that's particular diabetes or the negative consequences that can happen at certain points based on trends in blood pressure, especially when correlated with other variables such as smoking and other habits that show up in diagnoses and are used to have predict uh, are used to have predictive value for identifying and trying to prevent and divert instances of serious conditions such as um, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, uh, kidney disease that can come as a result of high blood pressure and things of that nature to try to set up those interventions. So based on that data, there are AI tools that are in development and potentially may be in use uh, either for to guide and assist in patient treatment or uh, just for the purpose of completing patient notes and trying to identify all the things that need to be considered in providing that treatment. So similar to the AI industry itself, uh, this regulation codifies the mandate to make sure that this is de-biased and to make sure that it doesn't lead to the incorrect conclusions just based on assumptions that are on these protected classes such as race, sex, national origin, and disability. And uh, it requires that human intervention to mitigate that risk and to make sure that there's oversight of the use of these tools so that discriminatory outcomes and and going deeper into the jurisprudence of the Civil Rights Act and the application of discrimination, uh, not just actual discrimination, but ensuring that there's not a disparate impact where people of a specific protected class are affected, even though it's a facially neutral application of criteria. Uh, that could be something that could lead to potential claims against a covered entity, and that's something to be mindful of as well to make sure that the tests and the standards that are being used even though they are facially neutral, they're not resulting in a outcome that disproportionately affects anybody within any specific protected class. And that's consistently one of the issues that arises when using large sets of data, and it might be an issue that arises in using artificial intelligence just because of the sources that it uses to quote unquote learn um, the predictive outcomes that it suggests through its algorithms and uh, programming. And this is codified here, uh, specifically talking about telemedicine as well. Uh, there's some inherent issues with the disabilities that can come up with telemedicine, such, such as, for example, if there's asynchronous use of telemedicine, uh, such as a recording of audio only, if the individual is he hearing impaired, that's not going to be useful. Uh, there would be further use or need for a translator, even for um, contemporaneous use of audiovisual telemedicine to make sure that going to the point earlier about uh, translation and interpretation for an individual that has an impairment, if they need to have signing done, such as in American Sign Language, that would be in addition to the telemedicine services or having a text-to-type option, uh, such as um, AI can be used and is used now in social media frequently to generate closed captioning or captions for uh, statements that are made in recordings by individuals. And my experience is that it's not a perfect translation, but it tends to communicate most of it. But in medicine, it's important to have that perfect translation and to take the extra step that's necessary so that there is no inaccuracy or ambiguity as to the meaning of what's being translated. So. There are some additional resources that we make available at the end of the slides here, specifically the Office for Civil Rights website, uh, which is within the Department of Health and Human Services. There will be a lot of information available there. The 
There is also a government resource for the Americans with Disabilities Act. There is a lot of information on the Internet. It may not be accurate. It may not be applicable to you. And most importantly, in light of these recent changes, it may not be up to date, and it might not reflect these most recent changes. Uh, there are some additional contact information for Ali and myself. I see that we have a number of different informations that came in through chat. What our plan is to respond to these via email, and we can go from there. And uh, if there are any other questions, please submit them in the chat so that we can respond by email. And we thank you for your time and attention this afternoon and staying with us as we covered all the material on the slides and this very important presentation.